Hey guys, as you can see, we're still in Florida, and I'm going to interview my grandpa today. So, what do you have to say for us? Uh, good morning, Tommy. Um, I saw Mom's interview. She did a good job. And I guess I'll start out about the same way. My childhood was spent in McCook, Nebraska. I was born in April 29, 1942, and that was a war, of course. So I grew up with my mother in McCook, and my father was in the Army, and he didn't come back to 1945. So the first time I saw my dad, I was three years old, in a train station, I think in Omaha, and uh, I was with my mother all the time, of course. We'd go shopping, and I'd go with her. She was a school teacher, and I'd go with her. I would then enroll. Then was she I'd your teacher? Yeah, I, well, she wasn't my teacher, but I went to her classes and, and became part of the class. So <clears throat> we got to the train station, waiting for my dad, and I really didn't know what to expect. And I asked my mother, is he going to bring me something? Is it gonna, do I get a present for my dad? She said, well, I don't know. We'll have to see. What do you think you'd like? I said, I'd really like a train set. So in the train station, here comes my dad in his uniform just as slim as could be, and a mustache, and he's kissing my mother, and I just thought to myself, who's this strange man kissing my mother? And that was my dad, of course, and he brought me a tray. He had to shop all over. I had to go to dozens and dozens of stores. None of the stores had anything, really. It was all following the war, so there wasn't much material or merchandise to choose from. He found a little wooden tray, and uh, that was his first time I saw my dad that I remember. I, I saw him when I was a little tiny baby, but I don't remember that. And I'm surprised you can remember back when you were three, though. <laughs> oh, I remember that very well, from the train station when we came in. It was 1945, and he, he went to the University of Nebraska, and uh, as a child, he grew up in McCook, and through the Depression, his parents lost their home, so they moved into a house that was owned by his mother's father. And it was a great, big, huge mansion that opened, and the house took almost a full city block. And uh, after the Depression, they divided up into eight apartments. So they, my grandfather and grandmother moved into the apartment along with my dad and my uncle, Stanley, and they lived there for the rest of their life. The, uh, it was a great town, and I just loved being with my grandmother mother and grandfather out there in the cook, so I'd go out there during summer. So when, later when I was about seven, eight, six, seven years old, I'd take the train out to McCook each summer until we got to uh, Chicago. And I think the last time I went when, when I was in the third grade, I was nine years old and went out to McCook. And it was a great place to grow up as a kid. Just a small little town, had a movie theater downtown, and it had the Ravenswood Dairy. And the cook was very hot. I mean, the summers were terribly hot. And of course, there was no air conditioning. But I had a room to stay in a big mansion way down in the basement. It was a very deep basement. And it was my Uncle Stan's room down there. He built, he kind of set it up for himself. And you go way down there, each step you go down, you get cooler and cooler. And finally, got the basement it was finally tolerable. And you could, you could sleep very well down there. The uh, movie theater and the Ravenswood Dairy were the only other two cool places in the whole town. So we, I'd love to go to the movies to get out of the heat. And we walked down to the Ravenswood Dairy for a milkshake. It was nice and cool there, too. The summers were incredibly hot. And they had a great swimming pool there. I'd go swimming every day. And I think the cost of swimming was nine cents. My grandmother would give me a dime, and I'd take off the swimming pool. I'd spend the whole day at the swimming pool. And they had high dives. They had three or four different diving platforms, different heights. Well, that's a fancy swimming pool. Oh, it was. It was a huge swimming pool. And I just loved to swim. Michael Stanley taught me how to swim when I was a young boy. He was, he was just out of, I think he was still in college when he taught me how. What I've been then, I've been about, I don't know, seven or so, seven or eight. He'd teach me how to swim at the, uh, at the Y. And uh, I like to dive, too. They had spring, springboards. They had one very high tower. And I don't know. It seemed like it was hundreds of feet high to me as a little kid. That, I think it was a 60-foot high tower, but I'm not positive about that. 
But I'd look at that. But I'd, I'd dive off the, the tent. So, is that like Olympic size or something? How much? Olympics, the, what they use in the Olympics or something for the Yeah, Olympic, Olympic size diving pool, whatever that is. And it, was a, it was used in competition around there. The trouble, and they had a lifeguard that sat on top of that diving board. One station there and one on the regular swimming pool. And that started the ladder. And the guy with the ladder would tell me, now, all right, you go up. You're not coming down these stairs. You're going to go off the board. There's no coming down. OK, so I backed down that back. And I keep looking at it and looking at it. One day, of course, you know, I climbed all the way up the top. And it was just, it was, a, it was terrifying. It was so high. And it, I asked the look, can I go back down? I really don't want to go up. Nope. You went up, you're going off the board. <laughs> so I, <went> <laughs> I don't know if that was true or not, but I creeped out there and jumped in. It seemed like I was in the air forever. And finally hit the water. And uh, well, I never went back up on that board again. That was it. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I like the other dive board. I do spring dives off the, I don't know if it was a 12 foot high board or, or whatever. It was just the right height for me. So I'd spend the whole day diving and swimming back and diving and swimming back. And I used to love to climb trees in the cook. They had these giant cottonwood trees up and down the streets. And I, I could climb way up the top and I could see over the whole, whole city of McCook and come back down. And uh, I finally told my grandparents about it. They said, don't go on those cottonwood trees. Those things are terrible trees. They're so brittle. The wood is very dangerous to climb on. Oh, OK. So I think I quit climbing those trees <laughs> that time. <laughs> and uh, well, getting back to my dad, when he went to the uh, University of Nebraska, he, uh, they didn't have any money, of course, for tuition, so he enrolled in the ROTC program and worked his way through college that way by being on the ROTC and working waiting tables at different restaurants and sorority houses and things like that. And that's where he met my mother. And uh, he graduated and went to work for Alice Chalmers in Milwaukee. And shortly after that, they got married and had me in 42, and the war broke out, so he got went right in the Army, of course. He was using the reserve as a second lieutenant. And he was going through the, the full four years of the war. And he was in the Pacific. He went through all the all the islands, the island chains, working their way up through the uh, out of the Japan all the way. And he had lots of stories about that and lots of photographs. And uh, he didn't particularly like talking about it too much. But my friends and I would just badger him until finally he'd sit down with us and tell us some of the stories about the, about the war in the Army. And of course, we hung on to every word he said. Yeah, it's interesting being in the Army. Oh, yeah. And let's see, after that, uh, after the war, we left McCook, Nebraska, and moved to Milwaukee. And we lived in a farmhouse. We rented a farmhouse with another family, his friend, uh, the Cannons. Craig Cannon, and they had uh, a couple of children our age, so uh, we had a really great time at the farm. It was a big, wide open fields and a, a small pond of fish and barns and outbuildings, and it was just a, a perfect place to explore and have fun as a little kid. And uh, my two little sisters came along when we were living there, which I found to be a huge interruption to life, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Here I was an only child, and all of a sudden I had two sisters. So after that, we moved to a little house in Milwaukee. And it was a brand new small house, and uh, didn't have sidewalks or any landscaping. So I worked with my dad. He put in all the sidewalks and driveway, and finished a lot of the outside of the house himself. So I remember we'd be mixing concrete up in wheelbarrows and building forms and building the sidewalk. And I would think, gosh, what a terrible amount of work just for a sidewalk. We could walk across the ground just as easily. <laughs> I thought that was a real waste of time, but it turned out real nice. And during the landscaping there, my dad rented a, a tractor, a rigger farm tractor. And my mother would drive the tractor, and he'd, he'd direct her which way to push the dirt and so forth. He made a little transit with a level of a tripod. And we got pictures of my mother driving the tractor, which are very interesting. She grew up with the farm, so she could drive tractors real easy. 
And from there, we went to uh, Western Springs, Illinois, in the suburb of Chicago. And uh, he worked for Alice Chalmers for a number of years until things were getting so bad that Alice Chalmers was clear it was going to shut down. So he went to work for a consulting engineering company called uh, Harza Engineering. And he became vice president of operations. And just, he just loved working downtown. He, he liked to get dressed up. He put on his three feet suits and took the train downtown every day. He wanted the Chicago, uh, the Union League Club, an exclusive men's club downtown. They didn't allow women. So once in a while, we'd go down there and have dinner. And from there, I went to uh, high school. And out of high, during high school, I, I loved to uh, work on cars. It was my real hobby, my, my passion. And I put different engines in different cars and wound up with an old Ford with a big hemispherical Chrysler engine in it. And we uh, also had a car, a 32 Ford Roadster, a race B class, B gas Roadster. And that's where all my time and money went. And uh, from there, it was time to go to college. And I really had no idea what I wanted to do or where I wanted to go to college, but a friend of mine that I worked on cars with and went to Bradley University. He was a year older than I was, so I thought, well, shoot, I got to go there too. If he's going, it must be good. So that's where I went, Bradley, and uh, had a good time, had a good experience there. That was in Peoria, Illinois. And from there, I went to work in the steel plants, the steel, steel mills at Republic Steel. The story about the steel mills was that uh, as I was going to school, I'd be called home every six months or so to take a physical in Chicago for the draft board. And they said, how do you keep giving me these physicals? Well, the minute you're out of school, for whatever reason, you flunk out, graduate, quit, whatever, you're ours. <laughs> you're in the Army. We were, were really short on recruits in this, in this particular district. So that's why you get these physicals, so you're ready to go at any time. Oh, that's nice. that give you more encouragement to stay in school. And I graduated. And I uh, worked summers at Danley Engineering, manufacturing firm, made power presses, and I had a job lined up there to go to work. And I told the uh, people there that I'd be going to the Army as soon as I graduated. I don't know if you want to hire me for that or not. They said, oh, yeah, we'll hire you the day you get out. You get drafted, your seniority will keep continuing to come back and go to work. Oh, fine. In the meantime, I was still down on the campus in Peoria, and companies would come down and interview me. And Republic Steel was interviewing, and a friend of mine said, let's go to the Republic Steel interview. Oh, there's really no need for me to go. I've got a job lined up. Well, I, I've got to go. i got to go. Why don't you go with me? So we went down and talked to him and said, you guys got to come up to Chicago and take a tour of the plant. You have to. You, you've never seen anything like it. If you've never seen a steel ball, you, you won't believe it. So we went up to Chicago, took, took the tour. And he was right. I just couldn't believe that what a steel mill looked like. It was like a whole new world. It was huge, huge machinery, huge electric furnaces, rolling mills, blast furnaces. We got back and said, well, what do you think? I said, well, this place is just terrific. He said, can you see yourself working here? Oh, I'd love to work here. Well, come to work. I'm offering you a job right now on the spot. Oh, my gosh. OK. Uh, only one thing, I'm going to be drafted the second I'm out of school, so I'm going to be available to come to work for two years. Oh, uh, no, no, you don't have to worry about that. You come to work here, you don't have to worry about that. What do you mean? Wait, well, is that legal? Well, it's a defense plant. They made a lot of, they made all the armaments, and uh, they rolled gun barrels for the... Oh, okay, I get it now. The Navy. So it was a, a vital plant for the defense. So I thought, wow. I went home and told my dad, he said, uh, I didn't think he'd take that too well. He was a lieutenant colonel in the army, and I'm not sure if he'd approve of me being a draft dodger by going to work for Republic Steel. But he was wholeheartedly in favor of it. He said, this war is terrible. I don't I don't think you should do any any consideration about it at all. Just go for the job in Republic Steel. If you can get out of the get out of the army. Oh. With his blessing, I went ahead and took the job. So that's what started my career at Republic Steel. I worked there for 23 years and uh, worked my way up the superintendent of maintenance. And they shut that plant down. 
So they told me not to worry about it. They'd find me a job in another district, in their plant. But they, I kept interviewing it. looked more and more like they, I was not going to get them off. And I went back and asked my boss, what's the trouble? Nobody seems to want me. Well, the trouble is you're making more money than they are already. <laughs> so they didn't want to hire you because they'd have to pay you too much. Apparently, our plant made a lot of money, a lot more than all the rest of them, and they could afford to pay us. So I went to work for Acme Steel. It was only about five miles away. It used to be Interlink Steel, and I worked there for 10 years. And finally shut that plant down, too. I said, well, enough of the steel plants. Um, I'm going to retire. I was 55 years old. I go to, down to South Carolina, where I bought a lot, because I, uh, it's a small little lake in Seneca, South Carolina. It was just beautiful. I knew about the, the lake in South Carolina because Ronnie went to Clemson, got his PhD. So I was pretty familiar with the area. And I bought a lot while I was down there thinking, when I do retire, I'll have this lot. I can put a house on it and I'll be right on the lake, right on the waterfront lake, the dream of everybody. So I went down there when I was 55, built a nice house on the lake, turned out beautiful. I had two boats, a motorboat and a sailboat. And then I thought, well, now I'm going to find something to do. So I joined the golf club. I thought, I'll get to be a real good golfer like uh, Rick. My brother-in-law, Rick, is a scratch golfer. Maybe I can get as good as he can. Well, there was no way I was going to be <laughs> any good at golf. So I got kind of tired of that and said, i got to find something else to do. And I wound up getting a home builder's license and building houses for 10 years. And uh, all, usually custom homes, the the spec homes, I didn't do real well at it. The other builders down there were just too good at it. They could, they could build it much cheaper than I could, and I just couldn't make any money keep competing with them. So I'd only build the custom homes, and I didn't have to worry about covering the cost or making ends meet. Because the, the clients were from the north. They had money to burn. And uh, it was a good time to be down there. And finally, I decided, well, in fact, I really wanted to get a bigger sailboat. I had the small sailboat on Lake Kiwi. And uh, I had so much fun sailing. I'd sail that boat every, almost every day, at least five days a week. It was a 25-foot sailboat, and Lake Key was a beautiful lake. And I just really enjoyed it. I thought, i got to get a bigger boat and do some ocean sailing. And sail, do some, you know, blue water sailing. And I'd, I'd always dream about this and go to boat shows and look at boats. And finally I decided, well, I've been doing this for 10 years. If I don't quit pretty soon, I'm going to be too old to, to possibly do this. So I put a deadline on, the, on uh, the house building. No more contracts after after January 1st, 2008. And that was just when the bottom dropped out of the housing market anyway. So it was a perfect time to get out. And uh, I managed to, I had one spec home that I had, had to get rid of. I built for a parade of homes and uh, had to finish up another one. Got those done, sold us back home, and uh, we sold the house in Seneca, and we got a condo down here in Tampa where the, this is being filmed. And here's a nice place. Yep, that's where we're at. Yep, that's where we're at right now. Wait, you didn't want me to show the clutter, did you? <laughs> Whoops. Did what? Did what? Did what? Show the clutter. Oh, no, you can show it. <laughs> this is us here. Let's see, where was I? Uh, Oh, but the sailboat. So before I wanted to buy a sailboat, I wanted to make sure I had a place to keep it. I looked all around Tampa here. There's just no places available. There's a waiting list, in fact. I, got, I was on two waiting lists, put a deposit down for a slip to, get, to keep the boat. And I could see this wasn't going to work out. So I thought, well, if I don't find a slip somewhere else, I started looking at it. We got it looked at insurance. And insurance is very expensive unless you live with north of a uh, Savannah, Georgia, because of the hurricanes. So I, I found a slip for sale at Squirrel Creek Marina in South Carolina, so I bought the slip. Then I could buy the boat. Then I bought a 38-foot island packet sailboat, and I spent a lot of time on that sailboat. And then I've had it for about 12 or 13 years, and made at least a dozen trips to the Bahamas and one to the Keys. And uh, I just love doing that. Go for three or four months, take off, from place to place. That's uh, that's what I'm doing these days for entertainment. Christine doesn't want any part of the boat. She didn't like the small boat in Seneca, so 
She knows she would like this big boat out in the ocean. <laughs> I know she would. <laughs> Is she scared of water or boats or something? No, she just doesn't like boating at all. Yeah, she'd rather not be on the water. <laughs> she'd rather <laughs> be on dry land. And uh, that's how that worked. Incidentally, I met Christine when I was working at Republic Steel. We were, uh, she was living on 94th Street, so she called with her parents. And myself and two friends were renting a house in Calumet City. And I don't know, we were just happy bachelors. None of us planned on getting married. It seemed like a, not even a consideration to get married. Just, this life was too good. We were all working, had, making good salaries, had our own house down there in Calumet City, brand new cars, and uh, leaving, a, leaving a life of Riley. It was my dad who finally sat me down one day and he said, you know what, you got to start thinking about settling down. Pick out one of these girls and, and get married and settle down. Well, I don't think about it, Dad. So the next time he talked to me, he said, you know, we've talked about this before. It's time you to settle down. Your problem is you're getting, you're getting more and more particular and less and less desirable every year that goes by. <laughs> so you better find yourself this morning to get married. <laughs> I thought that was the funniest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> so I did. We, and Christy and I got married. You know, we've been married for 50 years. It's a long time. I have uh, Ronnie and Johnny and, and three wonderful grandkids. It's been very nice. And, uh, yep, I'm the cameraman. I'm one of them. What now? I'm one of the grandkids. I'm yep, the cameraman. Tommy, Tommy's the uh, oldest grandson, oldest grandchild of the, of the batch. And he's... He's filming this right now. He's, he does some great work on videos. He puts them together. And yep, subscribe it. and like. So what now? Like and subscribe. Yeah, we should. <laughs> Show me how to subscribe and also, I'll sign up, Tommy. No, I'm telling the viewers, too. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, tell them, too. All right. Yeah, I guess that brings us right up to date. Right, so Is that I'll... it today? Right now, 10.49 a.m., 2019. What day is it? This is Tuesday or Wednesday? Yep. 31st of July. 31st of July. Mm -hmm. All right. Is All that right. it? That's it. Bye, guys. Bye.